Well, hello everyone. This is Jason Sisko and we are live coming to you from the Church Triumphant here in Pasadena, 1030 Strawberry Road. And we welcome you to another edition of our Prayer Nation broadcast. This is a time when we come together as a local church with a global vision and we pray for our community. We are praying with the same passion and the same fervency that we pray for the global church and with the global church. We have global prayer initiatives and we focus on them at the beginning of our week on Tuesdays and we just really talk about visitation, we talk about transformation, and we talk about multiplication. But here in the local context is where, as you would proverbially say, the rubber meets the road. This is where we are making it happen. This is where we're bringing it into reality. It's where we are manifesting, where it gets out of theory and it gets into practice. And so while we uh, do pray with effectiveness for the global church and we're motivating and providing direction, and we stand as a watchman on the wall that's looking out and seeing and knowing what time it is and being able to help others who need to know what time it is prophetically, and to know what we should do. And so apostolic plan, strategy, ministry, and authority are operating there on that global scale. There also has to be a concentrate. There has to be a place where it's played out and practiced on a high level. And that has to be our local arena. We have to saturate our communities. We have to saturate and win the battle here and when we win it here, the more effective we are here, the more we can spread that influence out and we can make a bitter, bigger difference out there. And so it's very important for us to be able to pray on a local level. So we thank you for those of you from Church Triumphant Family. Thank you for joining us today. This broadcast is especially for you. We also welcome our national partners and international partners that are so faithful and are so excited to connect with us, whatever we're doing, and they just want to be a part of it. And, and as I always say, when we're praying locally here, we want you to just focus in wherever you are, whether it's Maine, uh, Massachusetts, or whether you are all the way on the other side uh, in Madagascar. I don't, I don't know where you might be coming from. Uh, you might be over in the northeast. You might be in the south, uh, the south uh, east. You might be in the northwest or the north uh, or the southwest. You might be all across uh, the, this globe. I don't know where you might be praying from, but I just want to tell you that prayer makes a difference. Now, I want you to say this with me: Prayer can do whatever God can do. Say it again: Prayer can do whatever. God can do. It can go wherever God can go. Prayer knows whatever God allows us to know. So it is through prayer that we access all of the resources of God because God does nothing except in response to a prayer. So we're going to open our hearts today. We're going to open up our spirits today. For those of you that are joining us and will continue to join us today, uh, I just those that join online later, uh, watch later online or watch us um, on other platforms, I just want to tell you that we are making a difference together and we have to just stay focused and we have to stay at it. So I have some more instructions for us today. Uh, as we continue on this journey together, but I want us to start by just opening our spirit and all getting in tune with him again, and then uh, aligning ourselves together with our, uh, with our friends, with those that are joining with us here in this space. Father, we just come to you today, and we thank you for the privilege to serve. We thank you, God, that your presence is our priority, that to be able to put you first in our life, oh God, is a necessity. It is essential, oh God. My house shall be called a house of prayer. And this was, from the, very, from the very beginning, your divine design for us is to have a space where we can meet you, something that is hollowed, a, a, a place where, where we interact. You met with, with a man in the cool of the day when you put him in the garden. And from that point until now, there has always been a space, there's always been a time there's, there's always been a, a, a hollowed uh, 
uh, interaction that we have between God and man. And, and in that space and in that time, it is what we're doing now. It is what we're doing now. We know that, that Abraham built an altar. It was his place that he came and met you. But Lord, if we build altars, but we don't use those altars, they don't really mean anything. So if we say that we have a building where we meet together, well, we have fellowship there. We have instruction there. We have discipleship that happens there. But Lord, ultimately, we're here to connect with you. And so whether we do that at 1030 Strawberry Road or whether we do it at, at whatever our address is, or whether we're meeting on Facebook or YouTube or some other uh, social media platform, God, we are, we, are, we are wanting to interact with you today. It is actually doing it. It is actually being with you. It is the practice of your presence that makes the difference, Lord. And so we are here today, not just to discuss the prayers that need to be prayed, but to pray the prayers that you want prayed. And the first prayer is the prayer of our surrender, of our renewed loyalty, of our fresh determination to accomplish your will. It is that we are here to serve and we are here to worship. And so I come to you today and I thank you, Father, that you are our God. I thank you, Father, that we can approach before you boldly. I thank you that you are, that you exist, that you are the I am. And I thank you, Lord. Thank you for your spirit dwelling on the inside of me. I want you to say that right now. Thank him for the Holy Spirit right now. Would you do that? Thank you, Jesus, for the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. Thank you, Lord, that we are your remnant. We are here to pray. We are here to fulfill your will. We are here, oh God. Let the Holy Ghost just flow right now. I want you to just to lift your hands and lift your voice right now in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. We don't know what we should pray for, but the Holy Ghost prays for us. As, and as the Holy Ghost just begins to bubble up within us or, or begins to flow out of us, that's when we just we sometimes just have to let the Holy Spirit take control and take charge. And that's what we're doing right now. We lift you up, Lord. We worship you, Father. We thank you, Jesus, for this moment. All right, clap your hands to him. Clap your hands to Jesus right now. We're going to do something we've done before, but we're going to do it again. I'm going to bow today. I really feel important today for us to just renew our, our, our worship position. So I'm getting on my knees today. We're going to just bow together if you can. Uh, some of you may not be able to do this physically, but if you're able to do it, you may be driving or not in a position where you can do this. But if you can, I want you to just get on your knees with me right now. And we're going to remind the whole spirit world. We're going to remind ourselves and we're going to, most importantly, uh, remind the Lord that we are here for him and that we are worshipers. Father, we worship you. We bow our heads before you. We know that there are those that bow to other gods and, we, and they, they serve other demonic entities. But we know who the true and living God is. And so we worship you. And we bow to you, King of kings and Lord of lords. There is none beside you. There is none before you. And there will be none after you. You are God alone. There is only one God and his name is Jesus. We bless you, Lord. And we come before your throne. And we ask for the portals of heaven to be open to us today. That our praise and our worship and our adoration may come before your throne. And that all that stand as voices. Voices of an accusation that the accuser of our brethren would again be cast down and he loses the case again because we celebrate the blood of the lamb and we say thou art worthy O Lord you are worthy to receive wisdom and honor and glory and power and riches forever and forever you are holy 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 is the Lord God almighty which was and which is and which is to come we stand with the cherub we stand with the terabu we say father you are glorious your name is above every name and as the angels cry, holy, 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 we acknowledge you of our own free wills and say, thank you, Father. 
Thank you, Father, that we are your sons and daughters purchased by the blood that was shed for us upon the cross. We thank you for the cross today in Jesus' name. We thank you for the victory that you won at Calvary today. We thank you that the devil is defeated, that he spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And I thank you, Father, now that you have caused us to be church triumphant. You've caused us to triumph with you, that we are always triumphant triumphing together with Christ because of what you did at that cross, because of taking away the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, and you nailed it to the cross, and so we worship, we worship, we worship you, we worship you, we worship you. Though others be distracted, though others be deterred, though others be delayed, though others be depressed, we will worship, we will worship you, we will bow before you. King of kings and Lord of lords. All right, clap your hands to the Lord and give him praise right now. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, I bless the name of the Lord. I bless the name of the Lord. I just feel the richness of his presence. Can you feel it right now? Can you sense it right now? If you can sense the presence of God right where you are, if you could feel something shift and change when we begin to worship today, I want you right now just put on put an amen or give me a thumbs up or something to let me know. Give me some kind of a response to let me know that you are sensing and feeling the presence of God where you are and that there is more clarity coming into your minds today. In Jesus' name. Nothing transforms an uh, nothing transforms an atmosphere like worship does. Nothing transforms an environment like worship. This is how we design and set up a room. It's more than just getting the chairs and the candles and, and, and painting the walls nice and put a good picture or whatever it is that we do to design the room. I had some great help here in my office. Uh, they made my room very nice. But you know what? It is what you feel in the room. It, it is what, it's what the atmosphere that's created that gives the room its value. Because if you have a, a beautiful wall, but there's, a, there's an ugliness in the room, if there's a a spirit that is cold, if people are not open, then it doesn't really matter how pretty the room is. Uh, you know, I can go into a, a, dentist, a dentist's office and they can try to put funny uh, things all around the wall, but the reality is, man, uh, it's going to hurt and uh, they're not really my friend right now. But if we, can, if we can create an environment where we can say, you know what, this space is God's space. This is what worship does. We create our own environment through Worship. Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. So he's looking for a place to lay his head. He's looking for a place for his headship, for his authority to rest. And when we worship, what do we do? Worship causes a throne to be built. We, we enthrone him through our worship. He inhabits or he is enthroned upon the praises of Israel. That's the natural people that was written in those times. So we take that by type and shadow into the new season uh, and the new era, the new order, which is uh, now the people of God are not Jews outwardly, but inwardly. And so we do that in the spirit. They did it with sacrifices uh, of animals. We do it with the sacrifices of our lips we sacrifice the sacrifice of praise. So one more time, lift your hands because God is being enthroned in the midst of us. Father, we thank you again today. We praise you again today that you are always there. You are always with us. You never leave us nor forsake us. We can depend upon you. And there is a specific plan for every single day. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can trust the plan. And we can trust the gift. And we can trust the anointing. And we can trust the calling of God. And we can trust your will. And we can trust your character. We know that whatever you do with us is right. Even when sometimes we don't understand. The joy of the Lord is our strength. In his presence is Fullness of joy. All right, clap your hands again. And thank you, Jesus. Some of you are driving. Maybe you can't clap while you're driving right now. But you can smile while you drive. The joy of the Lord. I want you to say joy. This is my default. This is my default. Now, I want to tell you 
uh, something today that I think will uh, be beneficial to you. And I want to help you to understand this. Uh, this is how, how it works for us. Is that uh, when I was up in the mountains talking to the Lord, I talked to him about my promises. I talked to him about my purpose. I wrote down, and I'm continuing to write down in more detail, uh, a, a vision script of, of my life and what he has projected out to me, uh, what my future is supposed to be like. And so every time that I have uh, breaks in my calendar, uh, I have a opportunity to go and I reevaluate my life and I reevaluate the goals. I reevaluate uh, all of the, the prophecies that are over my life. I talk to God about the responsibilities that he's given me, the specific agenda items, the projects that we're working on. And then I, I open my spirit and I say, okay, God, help me uh, to be in alignment with you. And so at Church Triumphant, you know, I'm in my ninth year of pastoring here. We came here in February of 2012. And so I'm, I'm seeing now almost 10 years of being in the same place. That was important to me to realize. I realize I'm coming up. At the point I was coming up on 25 years of marriage. I just turned 50 and that's another big one to kind of process. It's hard for me to get my mind around because my kids are still young. I don't think that I'm supposed to be 50 yet. But also we have this feeling that many of the things that were spoken to us in our youth keep us connected to that. I tend to kind of go backwards. I tend to look back. Okay, wait a minute. Now, when I was 30, this is what you said to me. When I was 20, this is what you said to me. God, I remember when I was a, when I was a young man, I got the Holy Ghost. And, I, and I, you go all the way back to the beginning and you start tracking different things in your life and what happened to you at those different things of your life. And then you start evaluating, am I where I am supposed to be right now? Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? And what needs to change to get me where you ultimately want me to go? And so I talked to God about my promise, and he started talking to me about my pain. And in doing this, I had to acknowledge that there was pain of things that were left unfulfilled, pain of, of trying to get things done in people's lives that they necessar didn't necessarily uh, receive or want and could I have been a better leader there? Was that something that, that I could have adjusted with my staff, with my team, with the, the leaders that we have already in place? Is there something I could have done better? Could we be farther along? Is there a measurement and a metrics? Uh, and, and how do we uh, to, to go beyond? And, and I had to deal with uh, internal things. I had to deal with history. I had to deal with memories. And, and I have to deal with disappointments in myself. And and okay, God, what do I do with the, do about this? And the weeping comes, but I, I'm touching the pain now. I'm not avoiding the pain. And pain is your teacher. I want you to say that pain is your teacher. Pain is your teacher. And so I'm saying, okay, God, okay, God, here it is. And I'm weeping and I'm letting it out. And you have to let all of the perceptions, you have to let all of the ass assumptions you have to let all of the lies that have been told to you and all the things that maybe you have put on yourself, you have to let all those things out in the presence of God and then you have to come to what is what is real and sometimes there are things that you think you're, you're, you're doing well at that maybe you're not doing as well at and sometimes there's things that you think you're being horrible at and maybe uh, you have, you're not doing as bad at that as you thought but there is a an alignment and a calibration and God spoke some very specific things to me. And so I want to speak this to you today. I want to share this with you today. And, and because it was so life-giving to me, I believe that it will be very life-giving to you. First and foremost, God told me that I had been too much in a reactionary mode. Too much in a reactionary mode. And he talked to me about the season shift that was going on. That because of COVID, we had to just adjust ourselves immediately. And so we had to dump a lot of other things that we were doing in our life. We actually couldn't do them anymore. And so we immediately started getting trained, developed, stretched for whatever indefinite amount of time this pandemic was going to be here. And so we immediately instituted new structure in the church, changed some things in the church. 
we became very heavy with media as all the other churches uh, had to, as all of us had to go online, business or otherwise. We had to go online to do anything. So that was normal. You know, the Zoom, Microsoft Teams, uh, the different platforms that you can use, Facebook Live, um, and, and try to do as much remote uh, as we could. But we also felt the importance of being daily because the coronavirus task force was daily reporting. And we were being hit every day, so we had to pray every day. And so I was sustaining this amount six to eight times a week, I'm speaking, in addition to uh, phone calls and uh, uh, talking to people, you know, um, uh, through messenger or other ways and trying to uh, uh, help in, in as many areas as possible, creating vision and strategy for what we do as a team here, what we do as a church here and creating like uh, uh, things like uh, Operation Hope is what we did when we walked through the streets and, and church, you understand, you know, you were, you lived it all with me. And so we're doing this, but 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 I'm trying to accomplish something here. And then as I go in the mountains, I realize I have done what I was supposed to do. I cannot do this every day. I'm not supposed to do this every day because now something has shifted. Something is changing. People are, are not under that pressure anymore. We have adjusted ourselves. People are for good or bad. They're taking vaccines and that's uh, whatever side you're on on that. We're not debating that, but that's creating a... Uh, a different mindset where people are feeling more freedom to get out and, uh, you know, they're lifting some of the mask mandates, etc. And we know that there's parts of the world like India where we really need to be praying still in East uh, Asia and Africa and other parts where they are just, just being destroyed by coronavirus right now. But uh, even though there are uh, fresh outbreaks, there's much more uh, uh, knowledge about it, much more um, things that we can do uh, to handle it uh, in the West. And so people are, are adjusting themselves and they, they've learned about this, this forced new normal. So God, what are you doing here? What, what, is, what is God saying about this? God has always had a plan. God has always had a plan. And so God used this to mobilize us, to get us out of our velvet ruts, to do what? To do what for what? And the Lord began to talk to me about all these things that had been left undone, all these areas that have been left outstanding, all these things that we never got caught up on. We've never quite, uh, because we're living in this moment and we're trying to deal with all of the, the, the present tense. And so even staying up late at night, I'm trying to stay up late, and, but I was so tired and he was showing me how tired emotionally I have been, how mentally tired I have been, how physically tired I have been. And then he says, you have the power to reinvent your life. He said, all of this was for a purpose. Everything that I did with you was for a purpose. And how you calibrated your life, how you organized your life, how you, how you lived your life was this way. But now for the next season of your life, and I've said this before, but I'm just saying it again to you today in a little bit different fashion. He said, now you must be proactive. Even though I thought I was being proactive, he showed me maybe emotionally I am, or maybe inside of an environment, I always bring my environment with me. But in the, in the entirety of life, we have to get ahead of this. We cannot always be reacting. We cannot always be responding. We have to at some point get caught up, and then we have to get ahead. And so he said, I want you, you are now becoming a morning person. This is what you're going to be. You're going to be a morning person. You've been a night person. That was for a purpose. Now you're going to be a morning person. You're going to get everything started early, and you're going to get on top of things. You're going to be ahead of things, and we're going we're gonna to make the change. You have the power to reinvent your life. Now, I want to speak to some people today about this again today. We're coming back to this again because I feel this, um, I feel this, uh, this weariness, this tiredness, this emotional letdown is that when you've lived on this heightened level of warfare, heightened level of prayer, heightened level of, in, uh, 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 of intercession, when you have been uh, constantly uh, in, a, in a sense of alarm, you have been in the battle. You have been in the battle. And so when you're in the battle and you never get out of the battle, what happens? You start developing 
Uh, you start developing, you know, things. They, they call it PTSD, a, a post-traumatic stress disorder. You start, you start getting into this point where it's like you have lived in that war zone for so long. You have been uh, in this place of, of, of just frustration or intensity or banging your head. Sometimes I use the word just banging your head. You've been doing that for so long that you're, you're saying, okay, I, I don't know how much more I can do this. And so what happens is people just fall off. Some people just fall off and say, I'm not doing the church thing anymore. It's just too much. It's too much hassle. It's, it's all this fear of being around people. It's, you know, uh, you know, I just, uh, it, it, and, and they get out of the habit. They got out of the habit of it. Uh, and then they get out of the habit of living for God. And even though they love the Lord, they're just sort of drifting because they just can't handle the intensity of it. They don't want to have to deal with the resistance. They don't want to have to answer the questions. They can feel the trends. The Bible says there would be a great falling away. The falling away is apostasy. It's not people falling. It's people falling away. That's different. A just man falls seven times and does what? Gets up again. Say, I'm going to get up today. Say it right now. I'm getting up. I'm getting up. I'm going to stand up. And I'm going to keep going. But what do we have to do? We have to let God retool our lives a little bit. We have to readjust our time management, and our approach to things. And sometimes we have to let go of some things that we've been doing and let go of some mentalities that we have had before. And sometimes it means just making adjustments in, into what works best for us so we do more of what matters most and we make sure that gets done. And so I want to talk to you today, uh, pray for you today around your weariness and exhaustion I want to talk to you around this whole, this whole reality of, uh, of just of God's presence here in your life to help you take those next steps and to see the future that God has for you and to work on that future and feel like everything that you are doing is helping you build the future that God intended you to have. So when you recalibrate, this is where you see, oh man, uh, I have a lot of pain around this, or I have a lot of weariness around this. And if you are always listening, if you're always watching, if you're always, you know, uh, if you never have quiet space, you'll never get here. So you have to sometimes do the hard work. And so I created a new system for myself of the first thing that I do in my day is I listen. That's the first thing. The first thing that I do is not open my mouth and speak. The first thing that I do is I listen. I am listening for God. The second thing that I do is I confess. I confess what I already know about myself, what God said I am. Whether I feel like that or not, I make that faith confession. And you can make a very short version of that that also ties to a much bigger, larger version but make those statements, make three or four or five statements about who you are, who you are. So you were listening to God and then you make the faith confession. The next thing that you do is you embrace, you embrace, you embrace the role and responsibility. What goes with this identity? What goes with what God said I am? Who does God say that I am? He says this. Wow, that's awesome. That's amazing. This is what God said I am. Now, what are my responsibilities to that? My responsibilities to that. So I embrace that responsibility. I say, okay, today I am renewed my commitment to who I am, to who you say that I am. And then that which I'm hearing from God, now I'm adjusting myself. I'm looking at my calendar I'm letting God teach me and train me and develop me. And if there's more pain in there, then I have to say, okay, what is pain teaching me today? Or what is God speaking to me about my next steps of spiritual growth today? And then I commit myself. I put it on, I, I put my, looking at my agenda for that day. And then I go do it. I follow through. So those are the simple things that I just wrote down for myself that helped me to say, okay, in that first uh, segment of my day and the early morning 
uh, time, I'm listening to God and I'm writing things down. I'm making faith confessions. I'm embracing the responsibility. I'm, I'm letting pain be my teacher. I'm, I'm opening myself to be adjusted. I look then at my agenda for that day. I see what has to be done. I build that plan or I look at some of the plans that are already in motion and then I execute the plan. If we will just put sometimes little structure, little changes in our life, they'll have big dividends and big rewards. So I'm going to pray with you right now. Uh, this is something that really came up in my spirit. I was asking the Lord today, what is the biggest thing right now for our people and what can I pray? And I noticed on, uh, I had a session with one of our precious, precious intercessors in our church a couple of days ago and just the intensity of the battle and the intensity of prayer. And I realized that oftentimes we have been in this war zone and we need a break. We need a way out. And so sometimes what we think we've got to do is pray harder, pray faster, pray more intense, give more, but we're already exhausted and we're already tired. And so we, we realize something is not right. It's the opposite. I have to let go. I have to lift up my hands and I have to let my spirit open if I'm going to be refreshed. When I'm in the battle, what happens? I am closing my spirit because something is hitting me. But when I let the Holy Spirit out, it's counterintuitive. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So let's first talk about this weariness. I'm going to pray with you about weariness. Then I'm going to speak to you uh, some, some faith around your personal life. And, and we're going to talk about how you can personally reinvent. You can personally readjust all these things. And I gave you just a couple of my strategies, and we'll talk about a couple more, okay? Are you ready? We're going to release these heavinesses. I want you just to take your hands like this. I want you to open your hands like this, and I'm going to pray with you, and I will lead you in some prayers that you're going to pray out loud, and you're going to repeat after me, okay? But we're going to just pray together right now. And just let the Holy Spirit lead you as you pray. You can kind of you listen as I pray, and that can be a cue to you. But we're just going to pray a renewal of our ourselves, a renewal prayer. And this is part of what I do in my alignment prayers. But I put them at this segment so you can see that they have different functions. Not just uh, uh, the drudgery of coming in and, sub and submitting, but understanding that alignment is, is about renewal. Okay? So this is where we do our renewal prayers so some of this is what we're giving to God, and some of this is what we're releasing and letting go of for our lives, okay? All right, Father, we're coming to you again right now. I thank you for these awesome people of God. I thank you for every household and every family that's represented, oh God, by this time in prayer. And Lord Jesus, we all are here to serve you. We are all here to see your kingdom come. We want your will to be done in earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, today we also need our daily bread. We need strength to do all these things, Father. We need finance. We need a place that's uh, stable to live in. We, we need a vehicle to drive. Uh, we, we need uh, uh, you know, purpose in our lives, uh, occupation. We have to have peace and harmony with our friends and our family members. And we need, oh God, this, this community and, and we need each other. Oh, there's so many things, oh God, that we can say our daily bread. What is our daily bread? It's much more than just breakfast. It's, it's something else, Lord. It is the feeding of our lives, the feeding of our souls. And so, Lord, we come to you today and we align ourselves with you. I want you to say this now. I put my life in your hands, Lord. Okay? Now I want you to say my time and how I spend my time I put in your hands, Lord Jesus. Now say this, all of the things that I think are important, all of my priorities in my life, I put them in your hands right now. All of the aspirations, say that, all of the aspirations or dreams, I put them in your hands right now, Father, in Jesus' name. All of the goals, all of the goals that you have for me, I put them in your hands, Lord Jesus. Mm. Help me, Lord, today to offload and let go of everything that is draining my energy, that is breaking my concentration, that is keeping me from the purpose that you've intended for my life. I give those things to you today. 
in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. All right, clap your hands and thank the Lord for that. Now I'm going to speak. I want to speak to this, and, and this is going to be a hard one uh, for some of you today. Others of you, it will be something that you've already processed, and it's not that big of a deal. But for others of you that are watching now and will watch later, uh, the Lord really brought this to my mind, that if there is something, and, and this, is, I, I, this is very personal, and I recognize this, but we have to go here sometimes. We have to go here sometimes. These are things running under the surface that are draining us sometimes. If there is something out of alignment in your, in your heart and emotion, if there are things that sexually maybe that you have done or have been done to you in your life, maybe something presently that you're struggling with in these areas or something recent that happened to you, it can have a draining effect upon you. It can be a huge distraction. And this can be something even uh, with material that you've read or something that you watched that maybe you intended, but maybe didn't intend. I don't. Uh, uh, however, that played out, you saw it or you heard it, and it had an effect upon you. A spirit touched you, or it can be things that are still left from past relationships where there were so many other bigger things that you had to deal with that you never quite dealt with the emotions and the guilt and the shame around some of these other relationships that maybe are not in your life anymore, but still left a mark on you. So this is called soul ties, or they're called emotional obligations. And it exhibits a level of shame. And that shame marks you and it, and it is a curse basically on you that keeps you from your potential because you feel like something is wrong with you. You are unworthy. You made a mistake or somebody marked you and, and marred you as a victim. And so now you feel like something is wrong with you because of that. You're flawed in some way. So all of that just hangs there. And so you're saying, I want to do this great thing for God, but it's not really sincere because you're, you're dragging along all of this excess weight or you're still battling or you're still being pulled or your mind is still, and you feel a weakness. So what happens is when something is out of place or something has been done that's inappropriate, you've given power to that. And so what you have to do is get the power back. You have to get the power back. And so when you hear the word of the Lord, like what he spoke to me, you have the power to reinvent your life. What does that mean? Anything that is taking power away from God's will being fulfilled in your life has to be dealt with. This is one of the areas that I see a lot of times with people that they get stuck in these cycles because there's something there that's never been dealt with. And you have to let the Holy Spirit come in and clean out all of that and give yourself permission to let go. Give yourself permission to move on. I did it. That was wrong. It's not what I want to do now. It's not who I am now. It's not where I'm going now. And I don't have to live with this anymore. I talked about this last week in my broadcast about uh, I saw a broken tooth of, of some kind of a predator. Uh, and, and it was a man that was broken. It was, it was not a person from our church, but it was from another uh, church where I ministered to him. But I saw this. And sometimes I will see talons, like something was a claw. And usually this is related around sexuality or around relationships, divorces, or, or dramatic, traumatic uh, uh, emotional events where people were vicious or strong or there was a demonic spirit that really got their hands on them. And so sometimes there's things that are lingering. I'm, and I, this is another way of saying it. So when I'm coming back and we talk about 1 Corinthians 7, that the wife has not power of her own body, but the man, the man does not, the husband doesn't have power of his own body, but the wife. So he's talking about that in marriage is 100%, 100% power. Outside of marriage, it's never equal. The power is never equal. Somebody is always taking more. Someone is always getting taken advantage of. Someone is always taking a loss. And so uh, whoever loves least in those relationships uh, controls, the, controls it. Whoever loves the least, whoever cares the least is the one that controls it. The other person cares too much, so they allow themselves to continue to be disadvantaged. 
So at some point, we have to break the cycle. We have to cut it off. And I want to speak to things that maybe are present. I don't know exactly who I'm talking to today. I see a few names coming up, but but I, this is not me saying that what the Holy Spirit has given me exact name of a person. He gave this to me as I was preparing today that there would be people watching today that would need to have permission to unplug and disengage. This will give you the freedom to reinvent your life and to see your life differently, not through that lens anymore. Okay? <clears throat> Paul said that there were three kinds of eunuchs. And we're going to talk about those eunuchs in a moment. But I want to pray with you right now to release uh, all of this, uh, all these things that are burdens to you um, where we're unequally yoked in some way. Okay? And I hope that I'm helping somebody right now with this. I'm just stepping out in faith and I know that I take a risk even talking about it this way. But I, I want to help you. Who's, who else is going to do this with you? This is what a pastor does. So someone that cares about you does. I'm on your team. I'm in your corner. I'm here to help. And I want to do it with you right now. I want to pray it with you right now. Are you ready? Father, we come to you right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we know that there are desires that you put in us that are, uh, that are innate to us as human beings. You put that there. But Satan oftentimes uh, uses it as a tool, as a weapon to try to destroy people. Sometimes early on in early uh, formative ages, uh, six, seven, eight. Sometimes it's in adolescence. Sometimes it's at uh, the high school or college age. Sometimes it happens later on uh, in life. But Lord Jesus, I am talking to people today that are carrying around uh, all of these feelings of obligation uh, because of what was done to them or what they did. Oh God, and we want to give permission for people to be released from that emotional obligation where the shame can go away and where they will not internalize these things anymore, where they will not live in that past anymore, that pornography will not rule their minds, that uh, they will not be, be drawn in and constantly feeding on perverse uh, uh, information, however it comes in written form or in uh, visual form. Oh God, they will not uh, be, be uh, dominated by uh, predators or, or people. Uh, they will not be victimized or they will not be constantly uh, in this inappropriate thought process. But Lord Jesus, you can break all of these uh, perverse spirits off. And we know that this is something that's been in this area. And I did a whole session last week on Friday about how deep the wound goes. And we talked about the wounds around authority. And we know, Lord Jesus, that part of this uh, is that when there's a gap in authority, when people are not protected, when kids are not protected, when young people don't have boundaries, when we don't know what healthy boundaries are, this is what happens. Love gets misconstrued as something else. But Lord Jesus, as we come into your presence and as we are healed and as we are forgiven, we are, we are introduced to your word and your word shows us a total different pattern that is healthy and is strong and is beautiful. And you said, Lord, in marriage, the, the bed is undefiled. It is a wholesome and holy thing. And the enemy would like to destroy, oh God, your original intent. So Father, today I am just praying that you would help all those right now who are, have struggled with these things, who are still battling with them, to have the power to stand up and say no. To have the power right now to renounce and to break off and say I, I will not be controlled by people that do not have my salvation, my calling, and my purpose at their heart. Father, I thank you right now in Jesus' name that we are released. Now, I want you to pray these prayers. Say, I release every person that's ever hurt me, that's ever taken advantage of me, or marred me in any way. I give them to you right now in Jesus name and say, I forgive them, not by my strength, but by your strength, Lord, I forgive them. All right. Now I want you to lift your hands to the Lord and just lift it up to him. Say, here it is, Lord. Here's all the pain. Here's all the memories. Here's all the emotion. Here's all the way it makes me feel about myself. I give it all to you in Jesus name. Now turn your hands towards yourself. Turn your hands towards yourself. And I want you to say, Father, I am not going to kick myself anymore. I am not going to beat myself up anymore. 
I have repented and I have forgiven. And so I receive your cleansing. I receive a new heart. I receive a fresh identity of who I am. I receive right now into my spirit mm, your perfect love right now. And I am forgiven. Now, I want you to say this out loud. Say, if Jesus can forgive me, then I can forgive me. And I want you to say, I forgive myself. Whew. Okay, release it right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. He's the fastest forgiver. He's the fastest forgiver. Now, what happens when God brings you into his kingdom? He aligns you. He gives you a purpose. He shows you what's possible. And then you begin to dream. When God turned our captivity, we were like them that dream. He puts a dream in your mind. He puts, a, he puts an image of what's possible. And so sometimes you have to do the work of just writing down on a piece of paper, what do I really feel like God wants for my life? You can write down and say, what am I, what kind of marriage do I really want to have? What do I feel like the word of God says that I can have? Find some verses, take a look at it, use it as your, as your pattern, and then pray that pattern in your life. Thank you, Father, for harmony and unity. Thank you, Father, for, you know, bring that in. And so you talk about it. Thank you, God, for a life that is clean and forgiven. What does real forgiveness look like? What do scars look like versus wounds? Oh, wow, now they're testimonies. Look where God brought me from. So you know that you're healed, not when your memories are gone, but when there's memories without pain, that's when you know you're healed. But this feeling of shame, of, of always putting your head down, always feeling guilt, okay, there is a place beyond that. There's a place beyond that. And I want you to ask God, show me that place. Show me that place. Show me that joy. And then you quote this verse, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, you've heard me say this before. If you've been on these broadcasts at all with me, God cannot bless wherever you feel guilt. If you feel guilt in any way, in any place, God cannot bless it. And so any area where you feel that guilt, you have to release that. You have to come there and you have to pray it until the guilt is gone. And you have to accept it. You have to accept it. So you'll have regret and disappointment. If I only, and we live our lives, oh, if I only, if I only, if I only, no, let that pain motivate you. Oh, let that pain say, you know what? I will never do that again. I will never go back. I am not going back to that pit. I'm not gonna make that same mistake. I, I, I refuse. No, I am going forward. I will own what's wrong. I will own it immediately. I will immediately get back up. A just man falls and stands up again. If you have all these things hanging on you and all these unrealistic expectations and you're trying to trudge through and then finally it's just like, it's too much. Okay, falling away as apostate is saying, I don't even believe Jesus can help me anymore. I don't believe that he can save me. I don't even know if he is the savior at all. That's apostate where you deny the Lord completely and you don't even believe in the word of God anymore. That's apostate, people falling away. They are falling away from a construct of tradition that claims to be the word. But when God breaks away that construct of tradition, if all you have is tradition, you can fall away with the tradition. Or you can let God unwrap what truth actually is. Tradition makes the word of God of none effect. But if the tradition is taken away, then the word can have effect again in your life the way it's supposed to. So anywhere where the word is not working in your life, you have to say, what is this? What is it? Why is it not working? Because it's supposed to work. It's designed to work. His word goes forth out of his mouth and it will perform that which he sends it out to do. That's what Isaiah tells us. It, it, it performs what he sends it out to do. So if it's not performing it, then we have to say why. We have to ask why. And step back and let God uh, teach us. And so this weariness is, is being taken away. You're getting into alignment uh, you feel that energy coming in. You're going to get proactive. You're offloading all the things from yesterday 
that were there that are kind of there and you still have maybe a little bit more work to do. Okay. But keep doing that work to get rid of everything that represents where you came from. And now what are you doing? In the meantime, you're starting to craft the picture of your future. And so you live moving forward and every decision that you make, every right decision is a vote for the new you. Every time. So like someone that has an image of losing weight, for example, instead of it just being a diet uh, that you do for a short time and you lose a few pounds, you gain it right back because you didn't get the image of your new self. You just, just, just need sweets for a couple of weeks. Okay. But if you get an image in your mind of what you're becoming, I'm a healthy person. These are the choices that I make. I'm a fit person. I exercise this many times a week. I, I only allow myself bread on Sunday or I only eat sweets, you know, on Friday night or whatever you, you, but, but most, but I am disciplined. I'm focused. And you get an image of yourself in your mind of who you are going to become. Every time you do the right thing, every time you say no to the things that you used to say yes to, what happens? You feel better about yourself. Until after a while, you don't even want it anymore. Uh, I, I noticed Dustin on staff, uh, Dustin Clark on our staff. Uh, we had birthday cake for one of our uh, employee, employee uh, celebrations. We have all the employees come together as birthday cake. Brother Dustin, you want some cake? He just looks at me. He's, no. I'm like, you're not even going to eat a bite? No. He said, you know what? When you've been saying no to cake as long as I've been saying cake, it's not even, it's not even a temptation. He said, it's not even a temptation. Because... He has no desire at all for it. It's not because he's all these other things have been put so strongly into his life of healthy eating and what's in food and what food is used for and, and his image for himself and the fasting and all it's all channeled him into this. OK, and so it's the same. But he learned it, learned it over a period of time, the same thing. So decisions that we make, we keep it's a vote for who you are becoming. But sometimes you have to get into the script of writing it actually out for you to have the motivation to do the daily work. So this is what we're doing with Pasadena. So I talked about that now on a very individual level so you could relate to that. And I hope that can make sense, okay, to you. You can say, I'm the kind of person that. So when the Lord said to me, you have the power to reinvent your life. You're a morning person. He immediately just put that to me. You've been this, you're now this. And I went, okay. And if I really am that, then getting up shouldn't be that big of a deal. And I'm waking up ahead of my alarm. And I'm just shocking myself because God is saying, I want you up in the morning and I want you with me. And okay, he wants me here. And he said, you have to trust that I'm gonna be there with you every day. You have to trust. He said, you wouldn't make the change because you didn't trust that I was going to be there in the change. And so, wow, ooh, ooh, okay. But I had a word from Joy Haney many, many years ago that said, Jason, this is something you're going to have to fix in your life. You're going to need to be a morning person. And I didn't accept it. I didn't receive it. And it came back and God said, okay, that was for a season. You needed to be that way. But now for the rest of your life, you got to be this way. Remember Joy Haney? You have to fix this. That's now. We're dealing with this now. And you have to just trust. He's going to meet you there. And he's going to be with you in all of these things. God is never going to tell you to do something, to make a change, to adjust something, and then just walk away. He is going to be hands-on in the whole process. And he's going to keep giving that. So if you say, God, give me the image of the person that I am becoming. Help me to see where you want to take my life. Help me to see my next steps. Help me to see that future that you have designed for my life. So this is why we pray the blessing of Asher. This is why we pray and we speak words of faith over all of these prophetic utterances for the end time church. Why we declare them for us. Why we say we're the church triumphant. Why we speak but why we speak about the glory of the Lord covering the earth as the water covers the seas, as pouring out his spirit upon all flesh. And as we do that, we get images in our mind. What does that look like here? What's going to happen in Pasadena? A multitude in a moment. That's what he promised. So what's the picture? Our local level pictures, going out in the boat, working all night, catching nothing. But then God says, you've been a night person. You've been fishing at night. Now you're going to fish in the daylight, I'm going to change your systems. 
We're going to go out in the daylight and we're going to go into the deep and not the shallows. And then what's going to happen? You're going to catch a multitude of fish. And so you have this imagery of God is adjusting when and God is adjusting how and God is adjusting where and God is adjusting who. Then we have to trust that everything that he says he's going to do, he's going to do and then some. And so we get those images in our mind of a net breaking harvest. What kind of harvest is that? What's that going to look like? How do we need to be prepared for it? And so the certainty of the word is what gives us much more confidence than even uh, someone just saying, you know, map out a way from a financial advisor. Okay, so uh, this is so much more. This is so much better. This is God's way. This is God's word breathing into your life. And so we're doing the same thing with Pasadena. God is showing us not Pasadena as it is, but as it's going to be. So as we close out our prayers today, we're going to pray for our mayor here in Pasadena. I've already scheduled. I'm going to show you how proactive I am and how much I'm listening to God on this church. And for those of you that are not in this immediate region, you can pray for your mayor. But we're going to pray for our mayor today. I am meeting with him on Wednesday and I'm going to be talking to him about Pasadena, about the direction of Pasadena, our role in leading some of the transformation that we see God uh, speaking to us about, our five-year five, five year and ten-year goals for uh, transformation here in Pasadena. And I want to talk to our mayor about his heart for this city. And so I, I already have it on the agenda. I'll be meeting with him, Lord willing, uh, next Wednesday. So I want us to pray for the city of Pasadena I want us to pray for the habit structure and the the lifestyles and the way if people are coming out of drugs and coming out of pornography and coming out of poverty and all this stuff, they're coming out. They have to have new systems. They have to have new habits and they need mentors. They need people already modeling these things to not only help them get over the past, but to design the Christian life. That's what discipleship is. We're going to take that to the next level and not just disciple the families that are coming into our building and being a part of our church family, but we want to disciple Pasadena. We want to speak to the whole mindset of this region. And this is how we're going to see the will of God done. Are you ready? Let's pray it right now. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for the transformation that you have promised. God, you gave Bishop Glass a word back in the, in the 60s that said this was his city. And you told him that there was going to be a great harvest here. God, he has lived all of these years waiting. He knows, oh God, from the angel that visited him uh, in the service, the man that came uh, and told him that, that this church was different and that it had a heart that was different, that it loved different, that there were other churches in this area, but this church had a different heart. And because of that, we would have a great harvest that we would experience that, that, that revival that, that we had been praying for. God, there are specific words that you gave to me as the lead pastor of this church, that you said we would have a multitude in a moment. And so, Father, we are preparing ourselves. We are praying. We are building more strategies and more structure for prayer. Oh, God, we are encouraging it in every way as you told us to do, because that's what gets us out in the deep. That's what helps us to hear your voice. That's what helps us to adjust our lives. That's what tells us to get in the boat now and to go out in the middle of the day uh, into the into the deep and catch a draught. It helps us to hear the specific plan that you have for us. That's what prayer does. And I thank you, Father, we're streamlining every department for a multitude of fish, oh God, so that we can have the greatest outpouring of the Spirit of God that Pasadena has ever seen and this surrounding area has ever experienced, even going back to the era of Frank Ewart and and uh, Seymour, oh God, and on all of, of the uh, the early uh, of the early a apostolic movement of Azusa Street that came out of what happened here in Houston. Father, I thank you for miracles and signs and wonders. I thank you for demonstration of the Spirit of God with power. I thank you that these signs shall follow them that believe. That we see a church that is truly victorious and triumphant. And we see people of God that are praying consistently every day, that are living in the overflow, the abundant life, that are exuding your love, that have a testimony and a story to tell, that 
are equipped to be able to lead anyone anywhere uh, to the to the cross and to help them to know how to be saved and to facilitate the will of God in their lives towards their salvation. Father, I thank you that people will be baptized every day in their swimming pools. They'll be baptized in uh, in, in, in fountains. They'll be baptized. Uh, 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 you know, in people's spas and bathtubs. And God, we're going to see it happening every day. I thank you, Lord, that our homes are going to become more and more utilized for the gospel and, and for fellowship and for growth. I thank you, Lord, for new leaders being raised up, for new, new couples that are getting stronger. I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, for your strength right now, working through us, oh God, to get new community outreaches and new programs, oh God, to help us to meet big needs, oh God, in this, in this population and be able to help to be the hands and feet of Jesus to our community to meet basic essential needs, to help them, oh God, who are really in desperate places, oh God, to be able to be pulled into the right direction and, and brought into a place that is safe in Jesus' name. We thank you, God, for transformation. We thank you, Lord, for our mayor. We thank you, God, for the for the next steps, oh God, for Pasadena and our role as a church and for our leadership, oh God, working together with their leadership, oh God, that we can be able to, to bring about something really dynamic and special here in Pasadena in Jesus' name. All right, clap your hands to the Lord and give him praise in Jesus' name. And I promised you that I would talk to you about eunuchs and I want to be good to my promise. Sometimes we get in the flow of things and we forget, but I want to come back and make sure that we talk about this. And this is what God said, three types of eunuchs. Remember, one that God makes a eunuch, he was born that way. Some that men make a eunuch, a man makes them a eunuch, and then finally some that make themselves eunuchs. So these are the three types of single that there are. There are some people that are born to be single. They have an aptitude for it. God has a purpose for their life. Uh, maybe like Apostle Paul type person. And some have argued that he was married, but he finished out his life as an apostle being single. And he was very effectual for the kingdom of God because of that. And he wished that more people were like him because he could see his whole life was dedicated. We know in these last days, God said to me that there was going to be singles that were going to be uh, that were going to be used as his end time army. This is what he said. The end time army will be will be filled with singles people that are singularly focused, that you just have an aptitude for it, and, and that you are designed, your whole life is for that, and you will have a great reward for that. There are some that men have made eunuchs, which means that you've gone through something in your life, you've had pain uh, added to you, that maybe that was not the original intent of God, but a man damaged you, or mankind damaged you, and so now you no longer have uh, that capacity. And so there are some people that come out of divorces or they come out of uh, extreme abuse situations and they just, they're, they're just not, they're just not going to be. God gives grace for you to operate that way. And then there are some that make themselves eunuchs. In other words, these are decisions that they made, things that they did to themselves, how they hurt themselves, how they damaged themselves, how they emotionally uh, depleted themselves. They did certain things that, that make it impossible for them just to even mentally go there, emotionally go there. Um, or it's a decision that they just simply made uh, based on maybe uh, bad experiences in their life. Maybe it wasn't violence or maybe it wasn't sexual abuse, but they just said, you know what? Um, I just, I, I think I'll be better off this way. But w regardless of where you are in that process, I wanna say, if you are a single, God gives you grace to be single. If you are supposed to be married, God will bring that person into your life. He will help you. He will help you with it. But stop waiting until that person magically shows up before you become something. Realize you are something right now. You have value. You have capacity to serve. You have a way to make a difference and to leave a legacy behind. Some of the greatest people uh, that ever lived, lived that life. They lived that life. Jesus himself lived a life of a single. John the Baptist was a single. Okay, you can go on and on and on and talk about people that made huge impacts in the world and they were single. And so don't begrudge it, uh, own it, whether it's for a season or whether it's for the rest of your life. Uh, let God unload all this other stuff off of you and be content and walk in his grace.
All right. God bless you. We love you. I hope I've been encouraging to you today, to our Church Triumphant family, as we pray locally, and to those of you that are partners and connect with us um, outside of this region. We love you. God bless you. It means so much that you're here. And remember, don't live in the shadows. Live in the light of his glorious presence, because in his presence, it's always high noon.